Sudden violence can happen anywhere and anytime in public. Being situationally aware is your only chance of avoiding chaos. Do you have the skills to survive a 20 on 1 fight like this video clip? Or would you prefer to avoid being jumped in the first place? On today's podcast, we're joined by Superwoman Dr. Jennifer Stankus, former SWAT team leader and trainer Keith Graves, and our in house survival subject matter expert, Mike the Mad Bomber Sterling. You asked for more content on situational awareness, and that's the topic for today's panel. We'll be discussing actionable tips to help you level up your game. And we're back, and we got a star-studded cast of subject matter experts today. Everybody knows our in-house Mad Bomber, Mike Sterling, Keith Graves, ChristianWarriorTraining.com, and our favorite doctor, Dr. Jennifer Stankus. Today's topic is situational awareness. We're just going to jump right in, Jen, and our audience has specifically asked for actionable items that they can use to increase their situational awareness. Take it away. Yes. So it's a simple concept, right? It's being able to sense what's around you through your vision, your hearing, your sense of smell, everything in order to predict any threats and avoid them. That's what it is. And it sounds like a really simple concept, but I think that a lot of people aren't aware. And maybe it's just because we have gotten ourselves into this feeling of safety. If you look at animals, animals are always aware. They startle quickly. They You can't get anything by them because they have to be aware. So it's a mindset where you need to start thinking, I need to be aware of what's around me in order to stay safe. And the very first thing I would say is in order to sense your environment, you need not to be distracted. So the very first thing is if you're out in public, you need to not be walking around with your face in your phone and head and or headphones on. So very that's the very first thing I would say. Jim brought up something really good about animals. Humans are the only species on earth that doesn't run when it senses danger. I'm telling you, when you go take crime reports for people who have been victims, and you're thinking to yourself, as they're telling the story, you're like, why didn't you run at that point? Or you know, you're watching a video, it's, it's like watching a spooky movie. Dude, run. This is where the killer comes, right? <laughs> animals do because they're smart and they realize this dude's going to eat me. So I'm going to leave. Humans don't do that. And it's because they don't want to be offensive. Oh, if I walk to the other side of the street, he's going to think I'm a racist. No, man, something raised your hackles. Go walk to the other side of the street. Well, that's where you belong. Exactly. Exactly. And just speaking of that, I can't tell you how many times I've been walking along in DC or wherever, and there's someone like hot on my ass. And I'm like, why is this guy so close to me? I will literally step to the side, let that person pass and get back. On. I don't, I want to be able to see what's around me and I don't want people in my space. So. I do that all the time, Jen, and it freaks people out. And my, my wife will turn around and look at me and I'm standing there like this, waiting until they get off my ass and walk around me. And they look at you like you've got three eyeballs, not to hijack the conversation, but really great example on the animals. Don Mann and I had a conversation and we were discussing these garbage processes that the TSA has where they want to shake down my 79 year old mother, but God forbid that they profile someone as being a threat. And Don used animals. And as an example, he says, do you think that a rabbit looks at a snake and says, Oh, I wouldn't want to offend them. So, you know, I'm not going to profile that snake as a danger it was a good example. Profiling got taken over by the left saying it's a bad thing. There's racial profiling and then there's criminal profiling. Criminal profiling is a okay. There is nothing wrong with that. For me doing interdiction, I stop a guy with the felony forest in his in his windshield, you know, all the, you know, those little tree uh deodorant things to right. get, you know, we call them the felony forest cuz he's got 40 of them up there with all the air fresheners. It's like <laughs> normal people don't do that. And you start running into this line of question that you realize this guy's a drug trafficker. You do the same thing when I enter a room, I look around and I don't, my wife tells me I do it all the time. I do it subconsciously at this point, but I'm looking for good people and bad people. To give you an example, I go around the room, Chris, I see you, you look like an American. You got your camel ball cap, no fear shirt. Yep. We're good, man. He's a friendly, right? I go around and I see a guy wearing true religion jeans with a grill and looking like he's, he's looking for trouble. He's got an angry face. And he's just looking for trouble. I'm going to avoid that guy. I don't go over there. 
I don't want to be over there. Don't forget the neck tattoos. Don't forget the neck tattoos. Neck and hand tattoos. Yeah. I know everybody watching this is going to get mad in the comments now. If you look at that and go, that guy looks like a bad man. I should probably come over here. Then go over there and avoid avoid the trouble to begin with. And like Jen says, get get out of your phone, look up and look around. Yeah, I I routinely call these weapons of mass distraction. Our good friend Tony Blauer, in the example you just put out there, Keith, his advice is always the same. Choose safety. So mm -hmm. it's, it's not a difficult decision. It looks like there's something bad going on over there. Well, Jen frequently says distance equals safety. I did a free training for church security teams on recognizing danger. If you go to courses.christianwarrioretraining.com, there is a free class on, I can't remember what I titled it, but essentially it's, it's looking at iconology. What do tattoos tell you? What does a t-shirt tell you? What does the color of the clothing tell you? And how to interpret all of this. And that tells you a lot about a person as, as you walk up to them. And it lets you know about danger ahead of time. It's a half an hour. Go over there and get the free training. And it, it helps you understand a little bit more what to look for. You walk into a room and one of the things that we talked about is how to tell if somebody's carrying a weapon. Mm -hmm. That's not, I mean... There's people I walk in, go into boot barn, and like half the people in there have a gun. And it's like, cool. I'm good. I'm in, I'm in a place I want to be. But if I'm in a bad side of town and I walk in and I see a lot of gang members there, you know, you talk about iconology where they're wearing Norteño or Serenio clothing or Crips or Bloods clothing. And I see that and everybody's packing. I'll give you an example. I was in Stockton, California, which is a total crappy, it's the armpit of California, and which the whole state's an armpit. But could be worse, uh, could be Barstow. <laughs> Barstow, that's the asshole of the armpit of America. Uh, <laughs> right. But I, wa I walk into the gas station and I look around. I'm like, I went to go pay for, back in the day when you had to pay for your fuel inside. And I look around, I'm like, oh, this is bad. They're all gang members. Everybody's packing. And on my way out, I'm walking out. And then a carload of rival gang members wearing rival colors are coming by really slow. And they're looking and they make the U-turn and come back. I don't know what happened. I just jumped in my car and said, I'll get gas somewhere else, you know, and take off. Gotta go. Safety. Gotta go. That's a hit. Getting ready to happen. Do you want premium ad-free content? Duh. Content that's not censored by big tech, of course. But with SD Insider, you can get behind the scenes and a whole lot more. Link in the description. So, yeah. Mike, I, I know that uh, we're going to hear about it in the comment section. What, what are you doing on the floor? Well... Well, you know, I messed up my back yesterday, so the only option that I have is to, I, I pulled out a, pulled a uh, page out of my ex-wife's playbook and said, well, I'll just phone this in laying flat on my back. So I, I think one of the things that we as human animals have done is we have become so intelligent that we believe that we can listen to our intelligence and not listen to our instincts. And that's the one thing that you've got to do that we learned was you just got to go ahead and you've got to, well, the instincts are still there. It's all hardwired into you. Quiet your mind. Stop thinking about what's going on at the party next week. What's going on with your family? You know, what's going on on Dancing with the Stars or whatever, right? Stop thinking about those things and start listening to that little voice in the back of your head because you're trying to tell you something. That's that's good advice, Mike. I've mentioned this before, but I'll mention it again just briefly. My wife watches that TV show, uh, I Survived, and each episode has three people with three different sets of circumstances, which it was a miracle that they survived. But they all say the exact same thing. Something didn't feel right. But instead of choosing safety, they stayed there. Next thing you know, they've been abducted, raped, you know, beat up, whatever the case may be. Jen, when you go into a public venue, What's going through your mind? What kind, What's your process? Maybe something that we can share with our viewers that they could act on. You know, it's funny. I was thinking about this because, you know, it's become second nature to me too and almost subconscious. It's just like, you know, shooting a gun for the first time you're, or golfing, you're thinking about all these different things. But with practice over time, it just becomes second nature. First, I just want to say that our brains are hardwired and they're hardwired to look for patterns. And so when you see someone who looks like they're up to no good, maybe they are, maybe they're not, but you should pay attention to it and just be aware of it. But then the other thing that's really interesting about a lot of psychological experiments is that people don't recognize what's unusual, what's out of the ordinary, but that's the thing that you need to recognize, right? I always tell people to start just paying attention to what's in your environment. Is there anything unusual? Where are someone's hands? Like where 
is someone being too slow or too agitated or too just make it a game who doesn't belong in this in this game i mean you played that on sesame street one of these pictures is not like the others one of these pictures just isn't the same exactly (laughs) but it's true right i mean training kids at a young age to pick out what is unusual and what isn't right about something so i have a basic sniper course for police snipers and we teach about something called inattentional blindness and it's where they're focusing on something like they're Let's say there's a house that they're they're looking at, waiting for the bad guy to come out. And all of a sudden, the bad guy is in the driveway. And it's like, whoa, where'd he come from? And it's because you're staring at it for so long that you're kind of drifting off. And you didn't notice that he walked out and he kind of blended in. And one of the things that we do is we show a video. It's on YouTube. It's a great video. It's of a basketball team passing a basketball. And we show it. And when we get done, we'll ask, how many of you saw the gorilla? And like people are looking like, what? Exactly. Yeah. And there's a gorilla that literally grabs the ball, looks at it, holds it up and then walks past. But nobody saw it because they're trying to watch the basketball to count how many times it goes by. I want to say out of a class of 30 snipers, one guy sees it. Right. And and it's called inattentional blindness. And, you know, what I would say, too, is that there are lots of things that can distract you. Most often it's your own thoughts. So it may be a phone. That's what people think about. But. You know, I read somewhere really interesting. You know, people think that meditation is hocus pocus and that sort of thing, but it's not. If you just stop and you try to practice meditation for a few, even a few seconds, see how many times your mind gets off topic and goes starts running around. That's distraction. I can't tell you how many times I've been out trail running where all of a sudden I'm a mile down the trail and I don't even know. I have to stop and look around. Where am I? I My mind is in so many different places. It's incredible. So it's starting to practice there, being in the moment, present in your environment. That's where situational awareness has to start. You know, another good thing to do is to visualize yourself in a bad situation. Let's say you always go to this store. What would happen if I walk in and all of a sudden there's a robbery going on? And somebody points a gun at me. How how am I going to react? What am I going to do? And you visualize what you're going to do. And so for me as a cop, I always visualized if I see a robbery, this is what I'm going to do. Like when I first began, this is what I'm going to do. And then sure enough, one day I was watching an AM PM. I was driving through. I look over the AM PM and I see a guy run out. Clerk tries to grab him and he stabs the, the bad guy stabs the clerk. I was just cruising along, chilling out, no calls for service. And I was like, oh shit. And I jump into action, chase the guy down, get him into custody. And I realized my radio traffic, my everything, it was what I had been practicing in my head. I'd only been a cop for two, three years, but it was stuff that I'd practice in my head. This is what I'm going to do if I see some violent crime, even though I'd never had anything like that before, because I'd visualize it a million times in my head, then that's how I was able to handle it. So it's the same thing I do at church. When I'm sitting at church and I'm watching the door to make sure somebody doesn't come in and hurt us. When you come and say hi to me, I've been in five gunfights before you say hi, because I've thought about five different ways somebody could try hurt the people in the church. So I know when it happens, I will have gone through that a bunch of times in my head and it'll help me react better. I'm Jason Sawyer with Survival Dispatch. As a Survival Dispatch insider, you'll be able to gain the knowledge, the skills, and equipment necessary to protect your family when it really, really matters. They'll provide crucial information on such things as stockpiling food, medical necessities, communication plans. You will receive specific actionable plans. Visit survivaldispatch.com to get started. And Keith, one of the things he said was your radio traffic. So that's something, you know, as a cop, that was kind of drilled into me. You always need to know where you are so you can Mm -hmm. call for help. And if just practice this game with yourself, just randomly, like like, let's say you have to call something into 911 or whatever, where am I? How would I describe that? And most people can't. If you had to call in, where are you to get help or or to radio for help? Where are you? How do you describe it? Most people can't do it. My favorite thing as a training officer, it'd be three in the morning, the recruits tired, we're driving around. And when we get on a really long road, that's a residential street out in the middle of nowhere, I'll just go stop the car. I've been shot. Where are we? Yeah. And they would literally look at me like, ah, ah. And I'd be like, get out of the car. And I'd make sure it was a long way. Go back and run, look at the sign, and then come back here and tell me what the sign says. And I would make them run all the way back and come back every time. And they would never, every one of my recruits, you could tell who was my recruit because whenever they're like, where are you? I'm 
wherever. They knew exactly where they were every time. But it's important, right? And it's and it's a good mm-hmm. way to start getting yourself in the moment. One of the things that I haven't seen touched on anywhere when I was going back and looking at training for situational awareness was the awareness of self. How are you coming across to people? Are you walking tall and confident? Are you, do you look scared? You, all of those things are super important because you want to be a hard target. What kind of shoes are you wearing yep. in, in the place where you are? Are you able to run and fight if you need to? It was funny. I was watching the Wonder Woman movie and they're trying to dress her up and other things. How am I supposed to fight in this? But <laughs> You bring up a good point. We brought our kids up in the San Francisco Bay Area and we would take them to Oakland and San Francisco because it's part of our area. You need to learn how to take care of yourself. And I remember we would always tell my daughter, put your Oakland face on. And it was all your mindset is you're not a victim. That Oakland face, whatever you want to call it. I would buy drugs in Oakland. Look at me. Do I look like I'm from Oakland? It's how you act, how you deliver yourself. Do you look like you belong in that neighborhood? Can I pull it off in some neighborhoods? No, but I grew up in that area and I know I can walk down many on Oakland Street. Somebody's tried to rob me twice, but we were there to buy drugs. Each time it ended badly for the guy because we saw it coming and we're able to stop it. But most of the time, everybody leaves you alone because you look like you belong and it looks like you know how to handle yourself. Two sides to the you know posture, essentially, right? Is that when you're in public and you observe other people's posture, it's a good indicator, a good tell of, of where they're at mentally and whatnot. And on the flip side, when you carry yourself a certain way, especially if you're larger, you're muscular, you're a guy, Mm -hmm. if you have the right posture, generally speaking, people won't mess with you unless it's somebody who's inebriated that wants to prove themselves against a, you know, bigger, stronger guy. And predators recognize predators. So if you're walking, if you're, if you're walking, not necessarily walking, stalking, if you're walking like a predator, predators are going to, are going to recognize predator and they're either going to see you as a threat or they're going to see you as somebody to walk away from. He's correct. And the the other thing I do is I like to blend in. I want to look like everybody else. If I'm in a place like Oakland, a bad area, I'll do something like throw my hoodie on. So that way it kind of covers my complexion a little bit. This is kind of a bad example, but if I'm wearing a hoodie, I'll throw that on or a ball cap or something else. It just kind of makes me blend in with everybody else. I make sure that I have good posture when I'm walking, but I also don't want to draw attention to myself. And another point is we've talked about this in the last episode I was on about open carriers. Open carry is great. I said it before, a right not exercised is a right lost. That said, there's a there's a time and a place to do that. You, you want to bring less attention to yourself. And part of that is conceal carrying and then making sure you're not printing and then making sure you just blend in with everybody. If I do go, I dress differently when I'm walking around a city like Oakland, San Francisco, New York City, than I do if I'm walking around Lincoln, Nebraska, you know, and I make sure that I blend in to whatever community I'm in and I've got clothes for each place because I go around the country training in all those places. So again, getting back to situational awareness, it's understanding the environment that you're going into, understanding how people act, how they dress and paying attention to all of those things. Um, And just one thing about appearance again is, you know, so often our egos are what gets us in trouble, whether we don't want to look like a pussy and run away, or we want to project that we're wealthy and wearing some flashy jewelry or driving the flashy car or having the sign on the back of your car that says, I'm an, I'm a lifelong NRA member. Come back to my house. I've got tons of guns for you there. You don't want to project anything. Really, it's hard to to tell people to get their ego out of things. Probably the hardest thing, but get your ego out of things. Yeah, uh, Keith, when you mentioned seeing people printing, so those people who are watching aren't familiar with the term where you can see somebody's concealed weapon profile through their clothes. That's actually one of the very first things I do when I go in anywhere in public. I'm looking for everybody who visibly shows a sign that they're carrying, and then the next thing I do is determine whether they're my people or not. If they've got an American flag on, they're probably my people. If they've got an Antifa logo or something like that, they're not my people. Mm-hmm. If and when the shit hits the fan, I like to have an idea of who I think is probably carrying and who would be on the right side of things. Yeah. And, you know, speaking <clears throat> of which, one of the things that I think people, people feel like they're safe in a pack. They feel like they're safe because lots of people are around. You are not safe. You have to believe that you are your own protector and that no one is coming other than a bunch of cell phones to record things. So 
you know, there may be others around you who look like you are acting like you, but you cannot count on them to protect you. A good point about situational awareness. It begins with before you leave the house, where are you going? My wife went to Europe when she went to Europe with my daughter, when she went to Europe, she had a map, a regular map, not a phone map, but a paper map with where the embassy and consulate were. So if something were to go down, she knows how to get there. And then we've always had those discussions about packs. Of If you look at all the active shooter incidents, I got a great one. I show them active shooter class from New Zealand. It's the Moss shooting in New Zealand, where the people are literally in a pile in a corner of the room. And he just is standing there, just killing everybody. And there were multiple opportunities for people to take the weapon away, and they didn't. But everybody just cowered in a corner. And so my kids, my wife, everybody knows if something were to pop off, I'm not going with the crowd. I'm going wherever they're not going. What you just mentioned there, Keith, essentially with uh, Jeff Cooper's colors, he, he didn't state black. It's been added after the fact, but you just described condition black where people lock up and they yeah. com completely freeze. And on that topic, the second that I leave the house, I'm in condition yellow minimum. And I'm not in condition white anywhere but at home. And then depending on what's going on, might elevate to orange and red. But you said something really interesting on the maps, Keith. Two, three years ago, Redfin and Zillow removed all of the crime reports for property listings because it was, you know, prejudiced or some bullshit. There's a few websites that are pretty good. Uh, Crimegrade.org, NeighborhoodScout.com, and believe it or not, ADT Crime Map. So when we're going somewhere, I punch in what our, our route is the zip codes, all that kind of stuff. And it gives me an idea if, if we're going somewhere we haven't been before, it's pretty obvious when it says, hey, there've been a lot of violent crimes in this particular zip code or this area. Okay, well, we're not going to stop there. And it doesn't take much time to do that. The other thing is if you're in the area and you see a cop and it doesn't look like he's on a call, he's just like good examples, New York City, where you see cops on every corner, go up and talk to him to say, hey, you know, uh, I'm from wherever. What's a good place to go? What's a bad place to go? And they will tell you, I've literally rolled up on people in my town where it's like, you don't look like you belong over here. Do you know where you are? And they're like, no, like, it's like, you shouldn't be here right now. How about I give you a ride? Right. Um, I'm lost as hell. Please save me. <laughs> I've had that. I was in Chicago teaching at their police academy. I see a cop and I'm like, Hey man, I'm a cop from wherever. Where's the best place to eat? And he's like, Oh dude, this place go oh, over here. Yeah. It was the best. They know everywhere to eat, but they're a wealth of information though. Same thing. Like you talk about, they took. Redfin took off crime stats and all that stuff. If you call the police department, they're going to tell you the same thing. Oh, we can't give that information out. Just find a cop that works at that department and just be like, I'm just looking at buying this house. And I've literally had people call me. I want to buy this house. And I'm like, oh, man, don't. We got a meth lab from there once. You know, or wow. they'll tell you things that you never knew before. One other thing that you guys were talking about is being aware of where you're going, but don't forget too, that it can come to you. There's been a huge increase in being followed home, whether you're getting followed home for a carjacking or a robbery or a home invasion, whatever. That's a big part of your awareness too, is just paying attention. It's the same car behind you. Did you notice what cars are in the gas station and is that car still with you or not? We've done a bunch of videos on being gas station ready. And on that topic, I, you know, I can't speak for anybody but ourselves. When we pull into a gas station, we never, ever pull in behind another vehicle where another vehicle could pull in behind us and block us in. We, we won't pump fuel until we're at the front of the line and know that nobody's going to obstruct our means of egress. So the people getting followed home are people that are driving flashy cars, flashy jewelry, Rolexes, stuff like that, or they're coming back from a gambling thing, you know, like a either Indian casino or a legal gambling establishment, and they see them win a bunch of money. Owner of a certain store that has cash only. The people that aren't thinking about their own self-awareness and what they're presenting. It's a person driving the super expensive car with a Rolex that wins a bunch of money and just is flashing everything around. Again, it goes back to just blend in. You may not be robbed at the ATM. It may happen later. Yeah. Dang. They're gonna fall, they're gonna follow you and then take you off and bring you to all the ATMs and take all the money out. And yeah. Well, and and where there's no cameras, they know there are cameras. Yeah. The camera thing isn't as big of a deterrence as it once was thanks to COVID mass. That's interesting. Hey, so your Rolex comment, just an anecdote here that's pretty funny. 
Tony Blauer is the master of avoidance and devaluing himself. So he'd had a really good run of making money off seminars, goes and buys himself a Rolex, just as you mentioned, flies across the country, takes the family to the Big Apple to do a bunch of stuff. And they're in a store. And he said, you know, when somebody addresses you and you just you get that feeling that something's a little bit off. So he handed the guy the money and the guy looks at his watch and says, oh, that's a nice Rolex in such a way that Tony felt like, you know, I'm going to walk out of here. He's texted his buddy and they're going to roll me sort of thing. And he says, what, this piece of shit? Yeah, I just got it over here on Fifth Street. It, it looks like it's real. You know, it's a $50 piece of crap. <laughs> so just as a smart little spur of the moment thing to devalue yeah. himself as a target. It's not a Rolex, it's a Rodex. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there you go. I, I would like to discuss one thing, and that's going back to, we've got a lot of people that are, that are starting from square one here, teaching or going through exercises to learn better attention to detail and the things to, things to be looking for out there. And, you know, everybody's going to start from somewhere. And, and one of the things that I used to do with my kids is we'd be on a road trip or something. And I got to the point where I would say, okay, as soon as they would come back to the car, I would say, oh, how many people were inside the store? And they look at me and I'd be like, we're not leaving here until you tell me how many people were inside the store. And that's where you start. How many people are inside the store? Then the next couple of stops later, describe those people for me. How many men, how many women? Something simple like that. And then we would move on from there and be like, okay, what color shoes was everybody wearing? Something stupid like that. And I would always have something new for them. And we would turn it into a game. As a result, my kids wound up with quite a bit of awareness as far as people go to the point where for fun, we used to go to Walmart when it's tornado season here. Everybody's freaking out and wanting to buy all the bread, milk, and eggs because apparently French toast is the ultimate disaster food. I don't know. But we would go there for people watching. And that's a hilarious thing when two teenagers are like, hey, there's a tornado coming. We got to go to Walmart so we can watch people. All right, let's go. We would go there and, and we would just pick one person here, there, every now and then and be like, okay, tell me about what's going on with this person. And you'd have some frazzled single mom with four kids trying to drag her way through there. And, and yeah, we would go through these, these little exercises. Pick a person, figure out what you can about that one person. And Mike, one other thing that I read that I think is actually super helpful is kind of tell, telling a story about that person. Okay. What, what is their demographic? What is their job? What do they most likely do? But then then try to predict what they're going to do. And pretty soon you can start pretty, pretty accurately start to predict what people are actually going to do. Because situational awareness is about avoidance. <laughs> it's not about it's happened now. Oh, shit, what do I do? It's trying to avoid it in the first place. Yeah, I think one thing I would add that I learned many years ago, Mike, that further to your point is taking all of this in, not to stare at people, because when you stare at the wrong person, you now mm -hmm. their attention is focused on you and it could explode mm -hmm. in your face, so to speak. Boise, Idaho is a pretty chill place, but I was in the mall and this guy's got a big 18th Street gang member tattoo on his neck. 18th Street gang is uh, it's, a, it's a gang out of L.A. It's very bad. He's either here because he's recruiting or he's here because he killed somebody he's hiding out. But either way, it's all bad. So when I walk in, what did I do? I'm, I'm a former gang sergeant. I'm literally just staring at him. Like, <laughs> you know, know, you know. I'm like, literally for me, number one, why are you here? Number two, shit, what's going to happen? And he looks at me and he does the, what? And I'm like, oh, he goes, are you a cop? I'm like, oh, no, not anymore. It's not assault under call of authority anymore. Now it's just simple assault. And he looks at me and he goes, Oh, hey, wait, I don't know what, what you're, why you're challenging me, but you, you're in Boise, Idaho. That, that sticks out. And he's like, yeah, I'm here with my family. And that's their thing they always do to let you know I'm not here to commit crime. And I'm like, hey, man, I don't care. And I got to give it to Boise PD. I called them on the phone. I'm like, I don't know if you're interested. Man, they had everybody come from everywhere to come chat with this guy, you know, <laughs> which is exactly what you want, right? But it's that you were right on point though, right? Like I feel comfortable because I dealt with gangs for a career, but it's like, he called me out right away. Like what, you know, what are you looking at? And it's like, oh, <laughs> the mating call. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. Jen, I know you're on a bit of a tight schedule today. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Yeah. So I think that other game to play with yourself. So in addition to just observing people and, and guessing what they're going to do and, you know, knowing who's where and all of that, knowing your location is another game. But then the other thing is wherever you are, just stop. Where are my exits? 
You want more than one. And then also, what's my cover and what's my concealment? Are the tables bolted down? Can you move stuff around? What is your environment that you could use as a weapon? It's so funny just talking about TSA and what you can bring through and what you can't. <laughs> it's like, well, I can like bang someone over the head with my laptop. Everything's a weapon. What could be used as a weapon if you needed it in that moment? Did, did any of you see the video of the <clears throat> guy who was shoplifting from the grocery store on the weekend? And there's a staff member trying to stop them. They've got the buggy in between them. And this other employee comes out of nowhere with a two liter bottle of soda, tomahawks, like this hits the bad guy in the head, knocks him out cold. Oh, I mean, it was beautiful. Yeah, That's could, awesome. Couldn't have been better. Yeah. Improvised weapon, two liter bottle of Coke. He just absolutely ended that whole situation right then and there. It was like, yeah, okay, oh, we'll roll him, roll him over, put the cuffs on him, and, and pour him into a five gallon bucket and take yeah. him out of here. Yeah, he was down. But speaking of which, you know, like everything in, in your environment is a tool. I've had people in the grocery store who are literally right behind me in a really uncomfortable way. That's just not normal. So what I'll do is I'll get in line and have the front of the cart behind me. So I've got that much space. It's just a constant thinking about what's around you. Where can you go if you need to move? What do you have in your environment that you can use as a weapon if you're not conceal carrying because a lot of people don't or or they just decide they don't want to then but just as a game even if you are conceal carrying what if you have a malfunction and you don't have a spare mag or whatever lots of people just carry their gun i know just thinking about things because situational awareness is about fluidity and understanding what your options are predicting what's going to happen before it does. And then just the last couple of things are the biggest thing that kills people is their ego, whether it's they're trying to show off what they have or they're afraid well, to look. There'll be weak. a bunch of them down in the comment section, guaranteed. Yeah. There's always <laughs> ego down there. Yeah. You know, I'm not afraid to say I'm not a big person, but even if I was, there's always someone bigger. There's always someone faster. There's always someone who can kick your butt. I'm not embarrassed to walk to the other side of the the road. And if they follow me, then I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna run as fast as I can. Just backing up a little bit. You mentioned being aware of what your options are in an environment as far as cover and concealment is concerned. So we all know what that means. But for the benefit of people who are just starting their journey with being better prepared and, and better at survival. Explain the difference. Maybe give us a tangible example of cover versus concealment. So cover is going to stop a weapon or a bullet. It's going to protect you from a projectile, for okay. example. Concealment is just going to hide your location. You may hide behind a car door but that's not going to stop a bullet necessarily, depending right. on what it is. You may feel like, oh, I'm, I'm hiding, I'm safe. Not necessarily. That may be a good place to start so that when you can see that threat is distracted or looking somewhere else, then you can move to either out of the, the whole situation or to a place that actually provides cover. That's good. James from uh, Pilgrim Ammo was a private contractor, multiple deployments to the sandbox. Before that, he was in the Navy. And he brought something up when we were discussing this attack on Israel a couple of weeks ago. He said in his mind, his process, if, the, if it's going down, is to get to the closest area of cover and concealment and then decide what his next move is. But to seek safety first before doing something else, I guess. I want to say one last thing. It doesn't have to do with situational awareness so much, although... I guess it's kind of mindset, but you see all these people in Israel or people who are abducted or, or taken hostage or whatever. I just want people to have in their mind that you're not going to reason with them. It's like being in a, a legal deposition. You're not there to convince the other side to drop the case. They're there to, to mess you up and to use something against you. You have to assume if that if you're in that situation that you're going to be killed or bad, really bad things are going to happen to you and fight like hell. Get really pissed and fight like hell. I can't remember who it was. It may have actually been you, Jen, when we were discussing the Hamas attack and how a bunch of people just willingly went with their captors. They didn't put up any fight whatsoever. These are people who take great pleasure in cutting your head off and torturing you and sending it to your family members it's a foregone conclusion that if you go with them it's not going to end well so you're better to at least attempt a fight right out of the gate and stand some chance because once you're abducted with those types of guys 
you're done. And I'm not being critical of them or their choice because I'm sure what they believed in that moment was if I go with them, if I cooperate, if I don't put up a fight, they won't do anything bad to me. But you have to switch that. You have to switch your mindset and understand that that's not true. I, I think personally, it's conditioned black. They just froze. Mm-hmm. They weren't thinking in obvious terms. So <laughs> most, yeah. most people go to condition black. When we do training at churches, where you have people that they're concealed carry permit, they've gone to training. And the minute we bring out blanks and start being aggressive, people literally just, they don't know what to do. And all that training they had goes out the window. On that point, Keith, I know you mentioned it last week, but it, it's worth mentioning again. And I'd like Jen to hear this as well. What happened? to people when you ran the simulation on your churches having so four campuses by the way jen active shooter situation the fire alarms pulled there's smoke bombs going off there's full autos with simunition what did the majority of the parishioners do everybody froze for the most part the people that were entrusted to kill the attackers initially everybody froze nobody would move forward nobody would aggress the target because they've never had stress inoculation so for like a majority of the people out there this is you you need to do simulation training to get that stress inoculation. And the best way to do that, it sounds corny, but mill soft training, any kind of airsoft training, any anything like that where you're, yep, yeah, where you're using, I'll give you an example. I have my airsoft gun in my garage. If I'm the only one home. When I park my car, I grab the airsoft gun and I'll start clearing the house and I have targets set up to practice in case I come home and somebody's there. But you've got to put yourself in a position to have somebody attack you and you go off on that. So Krav Maga, BJJ, you know, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, Airsoft, doing all those types of combatives type things will make you a a harder target to kill, basically. So we're a little bit off the topic of situational awareness, but you just hit on something, Keith, that I want to share with our audience. As far as clearing your home is concerned, obviously, longtime law enforcement, and I know Jen and Mike have to be aware of this. They are aware of this is the rule of plus one. So if you come home and and somebody has broken into your house and they're still in the house and you catch them in your mind, there's always one more. You don't Mm -hmm. stop when you find that person. There's always one more. Just like when you pull somebody over in a cop car and you're trying to get people out of the car. Okay, well, it looks like two people got out of the car, but there's always one more. That is situational awareness, right, though, because you don't want to you need to keep your your vision broad. Yes, you're going to focus on a on the immediate threat. But then, I mean, it's why in all of your training, if you're at the range, you're trained, okay, you've taken down that threat. Now look around, what else is out there? It's the same thing. It it goes back to having a broad awareness of your environment. Mm -hmm. That's well said. I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole, but we've had a fair bit of suppression by YouTube over the years, multiple gun videos. We took 221 gun videos off our channel and almost immediately saw the suppression to start backing off. But for what you're describing here, the plus one situation, Keith has got some awesome videos on Christian warrior training on YouTube, where it's essentially like a simulated shoot house outdoors and slicing the pie and all that cool stuff. And that's a whole other video, but you can't find that stuff on survival dispatch anymore, but you can find it on <laughs> Christian warrior training. Well, you'll, be able to, you'll be able to find that stuff eventually back there behind the paywall on our, on our website. Right, yeah, shameless plug. If you join Survival Dispatch Insider, you can see all that stuff beyond the watchful eye of big tech. And there are actual um, places like WAFT, where our families train, W-O-F-T, that actually do high-level scenario training, where things happen. They have like a coffee shop that's set up, and you don't know when it's going to happen. You know something's going to happen. And even then, even when you know something's going to happen, people still make mistakes, but that's how we learn. So you want to make those mistakes, put yourself in those situations, or even if you're out in public and wow, that was a near miss. What did I not see? What did I, what do I need to do differently? And, and just constantly learning and improving. And because our mistakes are where we learn the best. You fail forward. Our, our training by every year doing this active shooter training, not as many people freeze anymore. More people are learning to aggress. Our best person is a grandma who shoots the best, has the best tactics, and she's a team leader with no law enforcement, no military. She just is a sponge and absorbs everything. And now she's directing people, you know, she's directing an entire team to coordinate fire, to get this bad guy. And it's like, yeah, go grandma. You know, that, 
That is absolutely awesome. So before we wrap um, up, tell our audience the story of when you guys were doing active shooting and you had a Milsim team, just airsoft guys against you guys who were highly trained military, how that went down. Oh, we were doing a SWAT doc course, teaching uh, prolonged, prolonged medical care for SWAT docs. And yeah, these guys, they, they, were, they kept relying upon their ego. And just like Dr. Jen said, you know, they kept on relying on their ego. They kept on coming out there. And myself and one other guy were just cleaning house on these guys all day long. I mean, it was awful. And uh, morale's in the dumper and everything like that because I'm just an EOD guy and the other guy was just an infantry guy. But we're working fundamentals. And that was it. And then the two Milsim guys who were there from our friends at Enola Gay, they showed up and they put our heads in the dirt and kept us there. And we couldn't get up. I'm hiding behind a cinder block. And yes, a, a fully grown man can crawl up entirely behind a cinder block. And I'm laying there, you know, rounds are hanging off the, off, off the back of my vest and everything like that. And then all of a sudden the rounds stopped and broke my head up, looked around a little bit, and they and their patient were gone. Why? Because they relied exclusively on fundamentals. They weren't doing anything crazy, anything special, anything stupid. There was no high-end dev guru stuff that they were doing. No, they were just doing fundamentals. And they turned their fundamentals onto our fundamentals, and they put us in the dirt, and they kept us there. And it was over. <laughs> and, and these are non-military, non-law enforcement. They had solid fundamentals. And they did not have an ego to say, oh, I'm a SWAT guy. I, I, I can handle any, any taker. Not necessarily, buddy. There's always a bigger fish. And I would hazard to guess they had the one thing that we hammer on over and over again. They had reps. Lots of reps. Whereas the SWAT docs, Keith, you know there's a lot of those guys on the teams that, that they'd rather pump iron than actually go yep. out and do the steps. Those repetitions are boring, and nobody wants to be do no, boring stuff. No, not. That's, the reps are fun. The best mindset to have is always as a student. Whatever, you can learn something from anyone, literally anyone. And so always approach any sort of training with a student mindset, with an open mind, don't show up and be like, well, I know what I'm doing and you can't teach me anything. And the way you're doing something is stupid. <laughs> doesn't serve you or anyone well. It's, Learn from everything. Learn from everyone. It's the cup of tea, you know? Yeah, it, 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 if your cup of tea is full, how can what I am giving you fill your cup? Now you're getting all philosophical. So Sorry. while we're on the topic of reps, I just wanted to draw a, a point to this. So this is this is the log for uh, Mantis dry fire training that I've done mm. in the past month or so. And these are all individual sessions and it goes on and on and on. And so I do the Mantis dry fire training in conjunction with crossbows, the burna stuff that you love to, Jen, the yeah. less lethal. And Coming from the side of high tech and business development, we used to always say what's measured gets done. So that's where I like the reps, because if you're doing reps and you're recording them with something like that, and you see that incremental progress, but it, it's funny, Jen, the fail forward thing. So you make progress and then you'll see the scores go backwards and you make progress and the scores will go backwards. So for me, I've got some vision problems at night in particular. So I got to the point where I was shooting over 90 consistently during the day. And I started to go out and shoot at night. And I was right back in the 60s for crying out loud. And it was like, that's a serious weakness. I need to fix this failure. And, you know, we tend to, and this gets back to ego again, but we tend to, to work on the things we do well because it boosts us up and makes us feel good. But that's not, that's not where you need to spend your time. For sure. All right, Jen. Where can people find you online and when is the next season of Surviving Man hitting the airwaves? Oh boy. So I think a lot of our viewers are familiar with the Pursuit channel, hunting outdoor stuff. So that's right now the cable channel that Surviving Man is on and shows are airing. I think they just finished up season one. Season two, episode two just was on Friday. It's every Friday and we'll go through season two and then season two all-stars, which I have to say was... <laughs> Pretty cool stuff. We we did some crazy stuff 40 miles off the coast of Belize and pitch black night. I mean, we got dumped out in the ocean with sharks and literally ripping currents, pitch black, and it's like gotta get back <laughs> to this this boat. And I mean there's no safety boat. I'm not kidding. This is like 
this is like truly reality TV. It's super fun. It was the most fun I've ever had in my life. And that's um, why the only water sports I participate in is taking showers. <laughs> anyway, I don't think people will believe it's real because who would do these stupid things? Oh, it's like, awesome. Surviving Man, great show. Mike, my, uh, Mad Bomber Mike, right? That's so when the people see you commenting, it's Mad Bomber Mike. Sorry, Jen, go ahead. Didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> I've backed off social media. I, I am on social media. I'm on YouTube. And um, if you want to just put that in the, in the notes, whatever YouTube and, and Instagram, but I'm off of there mostly because I was doing these firearms Friday drills for people and got canceled because <laughs> even if I'm using <laughs> less lethal, they don't even like that. So. So let's just say one of the top spots to find Dr. Jennifer Stank is right here in survival dispatch. Right. <laughs> you always have a home here. Exactly. Keith, all of your stuff, uh, YouTube, website. Just go to www. That's the important part. ChristianWarriorTraining.com. If you don't put the W's in front of it for whatever reason, it's going to give you some kind of an error because I'm doing this for free. So I'm not a tech guy. And I'm on that free budget. So once I can afford an IT guy, then it'll, I'll, I can get rid of the W's and you'll find every, all the links are there. Courses.ChristianWarrior.com. Yeah, uh, you can go to Courses.ChristianWarriorTraining.com to go look at what we got. We're putting up stuff constantly. We just put up everything from recognizing threats when you see something in front of you to identifying possible like active shooters inside of a building. What they what they're doing is kind of display themselves. It's high quality stuff. Uh, they can sign up for your newsletter as well. Yep, sign up for the newsletter. www.ChristianWarriorTraining.com. And YouTube is at Christian Warrior Training as well, right? Yep, that's right. Some good videos. Go subscribe to Keith's videos. Thanks. All right, y'all. Appreciate uh, your insight. Appreciate everybody's service as usual. And uh, look forward to the next time. Peace. Take I'll care. I'll be here on the floor if you want me. <laughs> Roger that. <laughs> I keep looking at you like this. I'm a Survival Dispatch Insider. We bring together survival enthusiasts and preppers to share knowledge and skills, which means you can enhance your preparedness for emergencies and ensure the safety of your community. The results you'll get improve your emergency preparedness by learning skills and strategies from experienced preppers. Build lasting connections with like-minded individuals to share your passion for safety and readiness. Access a wealth of knowledge and resources to assist you in protecting you and your community in certain situations. Go to survivaldispatch.com to get started.